Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Really excited to talk to you uh, today with my good friend, Travis Johnson out of Minnesota. We're going to be talking about why wholetailing is the perfect ad strategy, the perfect uh, exit strategy for the market we're going into. Professional real estate investors know that it's not really about the real estate. In fact, real estate is just a vehicle to freedom. A group of over 100 of the nation's leading real estate investors from across the country meet several times a year at the Investor Fuel Real Estate Mastermind to share ideas on how to strengthen each other's businesses, but also to come together as friends and build more fulfilling lives for all of those around us. On today's show, we're going to continue our conversation of fueling our businesses and fueling our lives. I'm glad you're here. Hey, Travis, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks. Thanks for having me, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Glad to have you. Uh, we just talked for a while. We should have just recorded that and made that a show. We were talking about all kinds of uh, good stuff here. And so that's one of the benefits for being having a podcast is I get to spend time with my friends and catching up and talking about stuff that, you know, talk and shop, right? So um, you see the talk when you enjoy it. So yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, so Travis, hey, I want to, I'm excited to talk about wholetailing today. I've been doing this for, we talked about this probably like since 2010, wholetailing has been my primary strategy. Um, and it's obviously become a lot more popular over the years. And we were talking about how it's a great strategy going into this market. If there's a little bit of a downturn or we'll see what happens here, how it's even, you know, a great strategy for that. It's going to be, it's going to kind of stand the test of time in up and down markets. But before we jump into that, maybe you could just tell everybody a little bit about your background as a real estate investor. Sure. Um, I came from corporate America. I like to say I've been part-time investing in real estate since 2001. Uh, so that means I had a full-time job, obviously weekends, weeknights, hobby, you know, buy a house, fix it up, flip it, that type of stuff. Uh, eventually hated my corporate job, uh, too much office politics. So I think a lot of people could relate if you still have a job that office politics can drive you nuts. So I finally put an end to it because there was no way around the, the employment where I was at. So I made a goal that uh, I think it was actually December 31st, uh, 2015. I said, this is the day I'm going to quit my job or my last day on my job. I quit right before Christmas. And I said, I'm going to go full time into real estate. And that was a risk. So basically 2016 on, and I've been doing it full time. But it was, you know, everyone's going to do a gut check, right? You know, like, is this the right decision that you're going to yeah, make? Yeah. But if you're motivated and you're committed and you're teachable, right? Anyone can really do what they apply themselves to if, if they surround themselves with the right people. No, so no. I've been doing uh, real estate investing, like I said, full-time since 2016. And I run a company called Minnesota Nice Home Buyers um, as our local company. And we invest heavily in the Twin Cities area and also central Minnesota, which is a heavily rural area. And that's a, kind of a unique uh, area for in our market that a lot of investors don't touch. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And, and we're going to talk about rural, some rural investing today too, and how whole tailing is a great strategy for that as well. So let's, before we kind of jump into this, like what, if somebody were to ask you, well, I guess I'll ask you, what is whole tailing? How do you, how do you describe that? Well, that's a perfect question. How I kind of describe it is essentially you're going to do what you do on a wholesale deal. And if you haven't done one or you've only done a couple, how I define wholesale is doing very little work to no work at all. Now, if there's some safety issues in a house, broken handrail, broken steps, missing smoke detectors, something like that, you want to always try and shoot to make sure that you can get financing on it, or at least conventional. Your uh, wholetailing almost guarantees you're not going to get FHA financing. Normally, there's there's something, one or two things that for sure majorly wrong that won't get it. So you're going to have to have a cash buyer or conventional. So wholesaling, you do very little to a property, but where the tail part, where we butcher it from retail, is that we're going to sell it more than likely to an end user that's going to live in the property or maybe become a landlord, it doesn't really matter. They're going to pay almost what a full retail value property is minus a little bit of the condition that the property in, which is not going to be as, as good as normal retail, but you're making like two thirds of the profit on, on a deal on a hotel without doing all the work that is required to make a property retail ready. So that's my definition of, of uh, yeah. hotel. Yeah. 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 Uh, and, and sometimes the profits are, can be higher. If it's a real heavy rehab, I found that, you know, if it's a real heavy rehab, a lot of times we underestimate the cost a little bit, how long we hold it. Um, and then sometimes the, the person that buys it from you, you know, cause I think 
retail buyers that buy a wholesale deal. This is what I, I, I generally, and we're going to talk about this a lot today. Uh, I generally think that it, they're great in working class neighborhoods where people do a lot of, they're more of a DIY. They do the work themselves, right? They're probably not going to go hire contractors to do that. And for guys like us, the labor costs a lot, right? For, to do those things. And it's harder than ever right now to find labor to do them anyway. Uh, people are going to, you know, if, if it's mostly cosmetic wallpaper, you know, old doors, stuff like that, they're going to, they're going to redo that themselves. It's, they might have a year of weekend projects, if you will. Um, and a lot of folks, uh, you know, they don't necessarily equate the cost of those things on the house to the value of their time. They just look at the cost of the materials and I get to do it the way I want to do it anyway. Right. No, you're absolutely right. And yeah, yeah right now labor is, is really the Achilles heel. It used to be with lumber, but that's finally coming down a little bit. But yeah. it's labor, getting dependable labor is another thing to say. It's just, yeah, even yeah. when you come, <laughs> on the final, I come to it, it's like, are they actually going to do what they say they're going to do when they say they're going to do it? And I, I hate to tell you, death and taxes are almost more guaranteed than what a contractor will, will tell yeah. you on a time when you're going to be done. <laughs> that's <laughs> funny. But yeah, so it gets, you get the best of both worlds. It's kind of like a, you know, it's not an assignment because you're going to take ownership of it generally. Um, but it's okay. kind of like a wholesale deal. You take it down, but hopefully, you know, you're selling it into the retail market and getting close to retail margins. Um, and it's really kind of positioning. It's like, I kind of, I always give it the example of it's like Walmart versus Nordstrom's, right? Like people are buying something that they know is, is kind of cheap and not perfect, but they got a really good deal on it, right? Oh, absolutely. And then the best way to try and also look at hoteling is the speed that you get from return on capital, where some people might yeah. be like, oh, I don't want to take down a property or I can't because I can't hold it that long. Well, that's a good thing. Hoteling doesn't really allow you to hold it that long if you're doing it right. You're, you're taking it down, making any necessary safety issue improvements. Some you know, properties that you get, you can immediately just put on. You don't have those issues. Right. And then you know, with the market slowing down a little bit, it might, let's say, two weeks to get an offer, you know, where we're used to a first day multiple offers. Now it's two weeks. Everyone's going to think, you know, the world ended because we had to wait that long. But you get an offer on it. More than likely, I would say by the time you buy that hotel deal and you do that strategy, 60 days later, that money should and more than likely will be in your bank account already, assuming yeah. you did all the steps along the way. Right, right. And you mentioned the lending upfront, typically more conventional, perhaps cash, but if it's a retail buyer and it's working class type neighborhoods, it's typically a conventional buyer, right? And, you know, one of the other benefits of uh, not using FHA is, um, like you said, a little more stringent um, inspection probably that you have to get through, but also um, you get around the seasoning issue because you want to move these things fast. So you don't want to have to sit on it for 90 days anyway, right? No, well, absolutely. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought up the seasoning because yeah, that's always the Achilles heel with that. And then also the 90 days is when it gets recorded at the courthouse, it's not 90 days from the day you sign the piece of paper. Right. Uh, I found that out the hard way also. So if it takes seven days for your title company or your closing attorney, whoever's doing your closing in your state to record those documents, and it's seven more days after when you actually bought it, you're really waiting 97 days before yeah. they'll actually take it. Um, I had to find out the hard way on a few of those. Uh, but once you do that, you correct your habits very quickly. But yeah, but you're really looking for the conventional buyer. And normally these are pretty good deals. And for the most part, getting a conventional buyer is not really that hard. You know, people shouldn't be scared by like, oh, I have to wait for a conventional buyer. The supply is still way down, even though the, maybe the multiple offer days are almost in a rear view mirror. It's still going to be a very common financing product. Yeah. Well, and I think, um, you know, we talked about it being the perfect exit strategy. And we'll talk about a little bit about, you know, if the market's shifting down here, um, how mm -hmm. it's a great strategy, even in that scenario. But I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, um, it's uh, the uh, housing affordability in most markets across the country is becoming more and more of a challenge, right? And so there's always people that will take, it's kind of like buying a used car. Like you don't get to pick what color you get even with new cars these days, you might not be able to, but you don't get to pick like the perfect scenario of the car. You just, because you're buying used usually means that you can't afford new or you don't want to pay that price. And so part of the trade-off is lower price, but you don't get exactly what you want and it might need a little bit of work as well, right? Correct. And, and the key thing is, is pricing the product correctly, especially if, you know, we are going to probably get a little bit of a slowdown, just making sure that your property is the cheapest property in that market for the, the, let's say it's three bedrooms, two baths, you're finding another three bedroom, two bath. 
and you're priced cheaper than that retail one, one, because you have to because of the condition. But the other thing is, is let's say that you want to for sure move it a little bit faster, just go ahead and price it a little bit cheaper. Yeah, you're giving up a little bit, maybe extra money on it. But when the market slows down, sellers also tend to get a little bit more desperate because they can't move as fast right. where they want to. That means you can buy deeper and make up that way. So that's kind of my strategy, how I did it before um, when I was doing not necessarily wholesaling, just actually retail flipping. When the crash happened after the crash, things were moving slowly. I could still move pretty much any one of my properties under 30 days, even the uh, 09, 2010, 2011. And yeah, I'd like to say I put out a decent product, but I was the cheapest house in, in that price range for that condition of the house. So when someone finally came out, went out shopping, they say, hey, I'm going to buy Travis's house now because they, they like me. They have no idea who I am. They like the house because they're like, hey, this is cheaper by like five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. The other one, why is it? And my main uh, reason is because I want to be the first to be sold. Yeah. And that how I make my margins is I just bought deeper, which I was allowed to do because if people can't sell their house when they need to sell it and they have to use an investor, they tend to get, I hate to use the word, but desperate and they'll, they'll take the offer. That, that you presented to them. And that's what right. I've been doing. Yeah, that's great. I, I was, I was talking to somebody the other day, even in like 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, let's say when the market was down and I'll even say 2009 and 10, when mm -hmm. people were running away from the industry, you know, they basically, the, the market so-called crashed. It wasn't that bad in Dallas where I'm at. The market was pretty resilient here, but even for houses that we full on rehabbed, we did exactly what you said. Like we would put out the nicest house. And this is, you know, in my first few years, we were heavy rehabbers and we went, every house was like fully decked out. Like we decked it out to the nines. You had to buy it in a way that allowed you to afford to do that. But also we put it like the nicest house at the best price or we're priced, uh, you know, at the same level as the other houses, but we're way nicer. And so right. there was always, all it takes is one buyer, right? You, maybe you're not going to yeah. get 20 offers opening weekend or whatever. But um, even in 9, 10, 11, it would be very uncommon for us to put a house out on the market and not have it under contract within seven days, even with someone saying there's a down market. And it would also not be uncommon for us to buy a house, wait 30 days to, by the way, in the neighborhood, there's several other houses for sale, buy a yeah. house, wait 30 days to close, do a complete rehab, put it on the market, get it under contract, sell it 30 days later, and all those houses are still on the market. And all we did was we just built a better mousetrap, better product at a better price. And then I insert myself at the front of the line, right? Yeah. And that's uh, literally, it sounds like even though we didn't know each other at the time, we were basically doing the same strategy. Yeah. Um, to yeah. Do it. And I only came up with that strategy because in my mind, that was common sense. Like, yeah. well, if you're doing something, isn't this how you would probably do it? And right. I did it and it was working, so I didn't change it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, let's talk a little bit about rural markets. So you do a lot of stuff in rural markets. Um, yeah. And I think even in markets, you know, in Dallas, where I'm at, there, there's most investors here never go out to the rural markets just because it could be it's too far away. And historically, like Dispo is harder out there. Like it might be easier to buy because there aren't as many competitors, but you do a lot of that. And let's talk about kind of whole tailing in the context of rural markets, like how it makes sense out there. Well, absolutely. Um, it's fair to have fear in an area that when you don't, you don't find other investors or at least know of other investors investing in rural areas. So then you almost start thinking, you know, am I charting their own path? Did someone already did this and fail? And should I maybe not be out here because I should only go wherever one else wants to go? And I get that. that that's the, the right logical mindset at first to have. But if you go ahead and also unapply the emotional part that you were making with the logical and just make a strictly business decision. It makes complete sense to go out to a rural area because the competition almost doesn't exist at all. And the thing is, is when there isn't competition, you can almost name your price to a motivated seller. They'll sell you the house. And if you don't think it's true, I would tell you, just go out and do it. And you, you quickly realize if they're motivated, they don't have options. If they want it to be their problem solved, they will sell it at the price that you named at. So I treat rural properties like bank owned properties. And, and that's a great way, I think, for people to wrap their head around if they ever been in a bank owned property where you're, it's on MLS as an REO and you go through and you see the normal, you know, blue tape over the toilet and the sticker, don't turn on the water, that type of stuff. Of course, I don't go to that level. I don't put it on, but I treat it like a bank. Bank, all they're going to do is clean out the property and sell it in as is condition. And that's what I've been doing is I go in the rural markets 
And I only uh, buy from people that are willing to basically sell their house at a deep discount. And then I just go ahead and clean it out. And then I put it back on the market tree like a bank, price it accordingly for the condition of the property. But yes, the dispo is the MOS. It's not right. another investor because you don't know where that investor is or investors and the MLS will either pull them out or find you a retail buyer. Yep. Yep. And you use realtors to, I mean, obviously if you put on the MLS, um, I mean, do you, do you rely at all on local realtors to those markets to help at all? Or do you just listen to yourself? No, absolutely. I am a licensed agent, uh, but I kind of just do it out of necessity, but I'm smart enough to know that I'm only smart in the area that I actively invest a lot. And when I'm in a really small towns, you know, they're, there's a lot of areas I'm two to three hours away, one way to go to one of these properties. So I'm like way out in the sticks half the time on these properties, but it makes financial sense to do so because the deal is that good. But I don't know that market just because right. I'm, it's in my seat. You know, half of these cities, in all honesty, I have to Google when the lead comes in. I'm like, I've never heard of this city. You know, I was right. like, where is it? Like, oh, <laughs> here it is. But then it's like, well, how do you find these realtors? You know, because I'm a licensed agent, I could list it. But let's be realistic. You know, if I don't know that market and this house that I'm going to put on is like a bank owned, it's going to be almost in an investor condition, like of being ready to be a landlord gobbled up. Or there's always a chance that a homeowner might want to buy it fixed up and live in it at the same time. Or it's actually someone that's going to flip it. But you don't know those investors. So you got to find the agents that know that area that already know those investors that maybe aren't looking on the MLS, even though you're putting it on the MLS. But those agents know, hey, John over here or Tori over here or someone else invest in this area, I already know I can contact them after you give me the listing and I'll go ahead and you know bring them to the table and, and buy the property. And I've made almost as good as margins on some of my flips just being in these small towns doing that strategy, yeah. but I have no competition. Yeah, I might have to wait in all honesty, probably 35 to 40 days in these small towns before inspection period, everything's done before you go on the contract. So yeah, I'm maybe closer to 75 days to get my money back doing the hoteling, but I didn't do anything other than I maybe went to the property twice uh, total. And then I had to do a bunch of paperwork, which is pretty easy because it's all done digitally now. And yeah. that's what you have to do. Yeah. It's that easy. Yeah. I think a, a lot of folks that avoid the rural markets, it, it's because the dispo is harder. It's usually easier to buy, but harder to sell. But I think you know, that's the beauty of, of wholetailing is the market out there, if you will, kind of quote market is usually the retail market. I mean, that's the MLS, that's the clearinghouse out there. It's because there's not huge pools of investors that operate there usually. Um, and then you don't have to compete with nice new houses in a lot of rural areas because it's mostly just older houses that might've had some updates here and there, or more likely to be people that, that roll up their sleeves and value sweat equity than in town yeah. where it's a bunch of people like me that just want it done for you. Right. <laughs> yeah. You, you hit the nail on the head, uh, sweat equity. Um, yeah. because that's what I found out by doing this, that most of the people I thought it would be more landlords. It's actually more homeowners that want to do sweat equity. They're like, Hey, got the, the, they could afford the property, but they can also do what they want to the house. Meaning I didn't pick the wrong paint color. I didn't pick out the wrong flooring, even though I think that I don't, but let's just assume they have the mindset. They can make it the way they want. They didn't have to pay to have something that's already nice put in, but not the way they want it and take it out and then put something else in. They already know they're starting kind of with crap. So right. it only gets there. So they get to have their HD TV moment, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of folks, you know, you might be selling a house at, at 90% of ARV minus repairs. Sometimes you could use a lower repair number because they might do the work themselves and value it differently. And maybe right. we should talk real fast about, um, cause I, I know what I think on this and I'd love to get your opinion. Like the best way to comp, uh, the market value, if you will, on as is properties, because you're not, you're looking, you're not going to, you're not going to do a full rehab. So sometimes if you, you to, to, to historically, most people are looking at what's sold and what are the nicest properties in the neighborhood. And if I were to model that, what could I sell mine for? It's a little more challenging for wholetailing because you're like, I don't want to replicate a really nice property. I want to replicate something that is equivalent quality to mine. Right. So sure. that's what I need to look for. Any tips on how to do that? Well, default is rely on the local realtor. Yeah. And I know that isn't the quick answer that you wanted, but that's really what I'm doing is trusting that agent in that market to say, have you sold any other junker houses? And what do you think this might sell for? 
but I'm going to apply a little bit of the actual pricing where it's closer to me. And if I was actually going to uh, hotel the deal myself and be the yep. listing agent in this current market that we're in, um, I was doing hundred percent of what the property is worth minus retail repairs. So I was kind of being generous. So if you do it yourself, you're going to see a very big benefit because you don't have the expensive labor added in. Sure. But I was selling properties as is hotelling with ease, just with that strategy. And sometimes yeah. I could be thinner, but I think you hit the nail on the head where you're going to have to probably slide down to a 90% of what it's worth minus the repairs. And don't try and shortchange anyone on the repairs. No one's going to be fooled like, oh, maybe they won't notice the roof or they won't notice the bad siding or the, the drafty windows. People are going to notice that stuff. So just budget accordingly for it. Right. But if you're right. doing right, you're making your offer to the seller, knowing all that stuff, so it's already factored in. So when you pass it on down the line, you're just the pass through collecting the middleman fee, the, the wholesale fee, but in this case, wholesaling. That's right. That's right. Yeah. One of the things I've kind of told people before when I co coach a lot of people and stuff over the years is like, instead of looking to comp it, if you will, instead of looking at the nicest houses, like just look and see what's the worst that, that, uh, that the lowest anything sold for and how bad was it compared to mine? Right. And so sometimes we usually look for the ceiling on the, on comps. It's like, just look at the floor. Like what, what floor has been set now in rural markets. Sometimes that's tough because there's not a lot of activity in the first place on the MLS, right? So that's that's always a little tricky. I've honestly, I've probably always been ultra conservative in rural areas that I'm afraid to death I can't sell this thing, and I'm always like surprised, like oh my god, we sold it like on the first day, and it, it, it's because my first impression is there's nothing selling out here, and but the reality is there's nothing for sale out here. So one thing pops up, and everybody's interested because there hasn't been anything there for a long time. Yeah, and that's absolutely correct. That's what we realize is the inventory doesn't exist. You just go to luck and you're like, there's one house for sale. And you're like, yeah, but the, the, the town population is 236. You're like, well, that's probably a fair number one, but you got to be realistic. That's one house to other townships that are still called that city, even though they're farther away. That still right. includes all those areas. And while people want to live in those areas, there, there just isn't any inventory. But even if there are inventory coming on, right? Because the market's slowing down. So it's going to start building up. You kind of hit the nail on the head once again, when it comes to looking at the crappier houses, because yeah, I do focus a lot on the nice ones, but when we can't figure it out, sometimes it's like, well, you, you said it best. It's like, what is the crappy one? What did it sell for? Right. And is mine crappier, equal or better than that one? And then I was <laughs> right. like, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, it's a confidence booster, but if you go in with being conservative in the rural market, because again, less competition means your conservative numbers should still not burn you. Where if you're in a competitive market, conservative numbers will probably burn you and you won't get the deal because you'll just end up being too low. But in the, the, the more rural ones, you're going to realize, hey, I'm kind of all by myself. If they want to sell, they're going to have to sell it at this price. And then when they move forward, it's already factored in into yeah, your pricing. Yeah. So when we first, uh, right before we started today, we were, we were talking about this topic and I said, look, I think wholetailing uh, has been a great model as the market's been going up here. Um, and if the market starts to come down or slows down or whatever, I think wholetailing is even a better, it's the perfect strategy for uh, a market that's starting to go down. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit. What are your thoughts on that? Yes, I, I'm kind of new to the wholetailing. Uh, I mentioned it before, I think I started roughly 2019 uh, doing the hoteling. Um, I dabbled in it before, but I always kept thinking it was a fluke that I was getting better prices. I was like, ah, this is a one-off. And then I do it again on a, a couple more deals later. And I was like, oh no, this was unique because of this. And eventually I realized either I got unbelievable unique luck, or this is really a pattern. Like people are buying these properties. So then I'm like, Hey, what if I start doing more hoteling on all these properties? And when they kept being gobbled up, then I, when right. I started losing my offers to sellers because I knew I could sell even crappier properties back on the MLS relatively fast, which then only got me more deals, which is, you know, the whole goal out of this, more deals yeah. get more money. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of compare, I use this analogy of outlet malls and those things are everywhere now, right? And they've really popped up a lot over the last 20 years for sure. But it's like people have this never ending hunger for value in America. We're all like value. And, and by the way, the, you know, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. Like buying something at an outlet mall or something, even a regular mall that's on sale, which I don't, can't remember the last time I went to a mall, to be honest at this point, but historically buy something because it's a good deal because I'm, I'm a sucker for deals and most Americans are, I think. And I'm hanging it up in my closet. You know, it's like, ah, it's not the right color that I wanted. It's a little bigger than I thought it would be. 
And, uh, you know, it hangs in my closet for like a year with the tag still on it. I never even wear it. Right. And so I think yeah. that's the analogy I like to use is like, there's a lot of people that just like a good deal. And I think as there's pressure on affordability, housing affordability in America, like people are going to have to move to smaller houses. I've seen a bunch of people on social media talking about how housing prices are so unaffordable these days as compared to like 1980. It's like, yeah, well, people live in houses that are on average like two or three times the size too. Like what's going to happen is people are going to start to go to smaller houses. I've even seen some of the big national builders here in Dallas. They're building like 12, 1400 square foot houses. Again, I haven't seen that anywhere in a long time, but that's the direction we're going, right? Is um, to make housing more affordable. You either have to get a smaller house or you have to get something that needs some work and it's imperfect and you're willing to accept a deal for that, right? Yeah, I think that's very fair. And then I think the trend for the near, or let's just say the next decade is one level living. I mean, the baby boomers are still going out in droves. I'm buying, you know, three properties this month that are all moms moving to assistant living, moms moving to a condo, dad's moving to a condo, mom just passed away. They want, they want to downsize. They want simpler, but they want living. They want something simpler. So, you know, right. a condo has an elevator naturally is normally how it works. Townhouses, eh, it depends on their age because obviously their, their knees are normally the big problem. Right. Um, so if you're saying that they're downsizing, if they, if they can keep it the one level living, I know, you know, for any builders that think about living, if you're like, what kind of product should I, I build? I'd say go with one level because we can't find them in our market. They get gobbled up in a heartbeat when one level living pops up because people need to be into those type of properties. Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. Well, I think we beat up uh, wholetailing today. So Travis, would you mind, uh, you've been, a, you've been an investor fuel for a little while now as a member, and would you mind just kind of sharing a little bit of your experience, a little testimonial, if you will, about uh, being a member of investor fuel? Oh, sure. Uh, without being on investor fuel, um, I honestly, I probably feel lost. Um, being a real estate investor, you feel like you're on an island at times, right? You, you try and network with other investors. So you kind of know what they're doing and the, of course, they have to see you not as competition. Well, it's kind of hard to do that in your own market, right? Because everyone thinks like, hey, if you're going to talk about things in your own market with an, another competitor, you're going to give up trade secrets or talk about things that are only going to benefit one side. Where like investor fuel, you know, you're bringing the nationwide type audience and putting them into a very large room at this point because it's grown very big. But it allows you to talk to other people with open minds, no egos, nothing like that. They allow... Whatever is working in their market, if you ask someone a question, I've never been resisted by someone sharing what, what works for them, why it's working, getting feedback on anything. Um, I even have a probably up on my shelf here, I have an investor feel that, you know, you get the, the booklet, you know, the, kind of the directory. And it's just nice. You go through and I pick up the phone and I call someone like, hey, there's no guys in this market. I have a lead for him or, hey, I, I saw him at the fuel event. He had some great info. I didn't get time to talk to him. He was too busy. I got busy. I reach out. So it's a perfect networking community. And for me, it was, I believe it was roughly six months after joining, I got one idea from Investor Fuel that was shared uh, at the event that I already went down the path uh, with a, a hedge fund that I thought I could sell a property to. And basically I was blocked a couple of years ago. No, we don't deal with investors, all that stuff. So I had that in my head. Well, uh, Someone in fuel, I forget who said, oh, no, I've been selling to them. And I said, no, the rules, they don't do it. They're like, oh, no, no, you don't talk to the live person. You got to use the computer. You get around it this way. And I did it. And I was able to make $80,000 profit on a deal that I was going to actually rehab. But it was perfect wholetailing strategy. But because of fuel mentioning like, no, no, that uh, the hedge fund is going to buy that way, I reached out and it worked out. Literally a couple of weeks later, I had 80000 more than what I would have ever made on a retail flip I made on that deal. And I've had other positive ones, but that's the biggest one that comes to mind. Like just yeah. being part of the group made me that much money just by listening and, you know, setting the ego aside. I don't feel like I have one because I'm always learning, but other people set their egos aside and share this information, which is very valuable. And I just don't see myself anywhere else, but investor fuel for my education and networking for other investors. That's awesome, man. I, I didn't know that. That's great. You know, one of the things that I want to uh, share is that people, something you shared with me before we even recorded here was that um, we have a pretty active Facebook group community for just members only. And somebody posted in there and needed some help with something. And you, you, you told me you responded um, and that you could help. Like you were very familiar with this issue and that they didn't write back. They probably got busy or whatever. And that you went out of their way to call them and say, 
you know what? I know they need help. I mean, that, that, that culture, that's the culture that we have is people that really want to help each other and everybody's busy. And I'm not saying that happens every day, but just the fact that you took an extra step to try to help somebody and call them when they hadn't responded to your email is the exact culture that we've built here. And that we try to lean into, uh, is just having amazing people that help each other. And I think a lot of, you said it up front, you feel like we're, we're on an Island a lot of times. And, and I think we really have an amazing brotherhood, sisterhood of people that are looking out for one another and helping one another. And I think even going into a shifting market here, and I'm not a doomsdayer. I think the, I think honestly, times are going to get better for real estate investors if the market shifts here. Um, but it, especially those that are in a community like Investor Fuel, where we can talk ourselves through, here's what's going on. Here's how I'm changing things. Pull each other off the ledge every once in a while, whatever it takes to make yeah. sure that we all get through this together. We did that with COVID. We've done it with every sort of issue that's popped up. And together, you know, together we're better, quite frankly. Oh, it, it absolutely. That's the only way it works. And, yeah. and maybe some people don't know this about fuel. I mean, that's already if you don't until you investigate more. But you have a guaranteed four meetings a year, if not more, if you do the other events. But I'm just saying you're going to have four meetings throughout the year, almost on a quarterly basis, where you're going to be obviously invited out to wherever it's hosted at to get with everyone. I try and attend every single one of those. I, it, I only miss one ever since joining. And that was because my son's birthday. Uh, overlapped one of the dates. That was the only reason why I want to attend is because of my son's birth. But outside of that, I, there's no excuse not to attend because I don't know what type of wealth and nugget of information that's going to be shared at the event. And because I wasn't there, I wasn't going to be able to capitalize on it. So it, it's worth its weight in gold. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Travis, uh, I, I know you've got a book out and you've got some other information. If folks wanted to connect with you or get a copy of your book or anything like that, can you share where, where they would go? Sure. Yep. I, I'll kind of show, obviously, for the people displaying. I have a book called uh, Seven. Flipping, yeah. Yep. And Sorry, uh, take the words out of your mouth. Sorry. So. <laughs> that's all right. Uh, if you wanted, th this book was designed is basically to tell people that if you're kind of new to investing or you dabbled a little bit, but you haven't really got your, your feet wet enough, this is like the A to the Z for investing on real estate. This kind of basically tells you, you know, how to get the business up and running the different marketing strategies, how to deal with motivated sellers, how they interact with them, you know, from setting appointments, setting goals for yourself, let alone I have a whole chapter about hard knocks, uh, how to come up with ARVs, you know, it's just basically a one on one guy, A to Z, how to do stuff. So if if you're kind of new and you're dabbling around, I encourage people to get the book, I basically just want you to cover my cost of shipping. So you can go uh, uh, to www.bookbytravis.com. Again, bookbytravis.com, and I'll send you over to my website. And basically, I'm going to ask you 10 bucks for shipping, and I can go ahead and ship the book out to you if you want it. If you don't want the physical book and you want to be on the digital platform, you can go on to Amazon Kindle. Uh, you can type in Seven Figure Flipping or type in Travis Johnson, I believe, in the search bar of Amazon, and you can get it on Kindle. I think I only charge like three bucks there. And the reason why I'm trying to keep it very affordable is because I want people to be able to maximize their chance at learning real estate. Uh, without feeling like they're being bogged down with cost and not sure if it's worth their time. Uh, so I think it's a, a very good entry level product to get exposed yeah. to real estate. If you like anything about what you read or what I share with you, you know, obviously let's reach out and see if we can connect and do other things together. Yeah, that's awesome, Travis. Well, hey, thanks so much for sharing that. Thanks so much for sharing all your knowledge on uh, wholetailing today. Yeah, no, I have no problem. And the one thing that I want to do before we wrap up, if it's all right, Achilles heel, I think for every real estate investor is follow up, follow up, follow up on leads. Mm. Um, that is just, I can't say it until I'm blue in the face. You got to follow up on any leads that come in just because it's not a yes today, or you can't connect with someone today, or they won't reply to an email or a phone call type of thing. If they raise their hand until they tell you to stop bugging them, you follow up all the time with them. And because when you do that, you will reap the rewards big time in the business and people that don't do follow up, We'll be in business and out of business probably under six months. And that's just yeah. my honest opinion. The money is in the follow-up, but there's no doubt about it. It absolutely is. And, and it sounds like such a simple kind of boring thing to do, but it works. And that's where majority of our profit comes from is from follow-up. You know, in this market too, as we shift here, there's people that didn't accept your offers before that are going to become a little more realistic, a little more open to selling. Don't wish these things on anybody. There's going to be some people that lose jobs, have other issues that kind of come along. And I think that's, that's the main thing is if people contacted you in the first place, there's, there's, you know, there's some smoke there, right? Maybe not fire yet, but for a lot of folks, and again, we don't wish this on anybody as real estate investors, but sometimes as time goes by, their situation doesn't get better. 
And uh, that's why the follow-up is important. If you do a good job of really caring about that person, listening to them, trying to help them out, they're going to remember that because there's a lot of people that won't even take the time to try to truly help them. And those things come back around. I mean, I've, I've proven that many, many times over. I know you have too. Oh yeah. It's, I believe in karma. If you treat people yeah. right, you don't, it'll work itself all out. And to give a dollar value, if someone was ever curious, because we ran the math on this several years in a row, we get minimum three year uh, leads a year that are over two years, uh, two years or older that we get three leads that'll come to life out of that database. And you never know which ones, right? You have to touch them all. You never know which yeah. one and touch them. But three, and for us, we run the math. Each lead conversion is worth at least $30,000 profit to us. So just think about your existing database at a minimum being worth at least $90,000. And if that doesn't get you excited for old, boring leads that are sitting there that maybe you've tried for a year and a half and they don't respond to you, when they finally do, it'll pay off. And so it's like, yeah, you always got to fill the hopper with new leads, right? That's how the business kind of works. But you got to make sure you stay in touch with the old ones because it's so worth it. And I, I hope other people make more than I do on the follow-up, but I just want to put a dollar value because we did run the math. We're like, holy cow, this is actually pretty profitable staying in contact with people. Absolutely. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, Travis, thanks again for everything. Yeah. I really appreciate that you had me on. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And everybody, hey, thanks so much for joining us today. Hopefully you got some value from our discussion here. Uh, we do have another Investor Fuel event coming up right around the corner. We'd love to talk to you. We have an amazing group of amazing people like Travis um, that really come in and just share everything they know, learn in the process and reciprocate back and forth about how to just keep sharing and learning. And we're all a bunch of uh, we're all a bunch of uh, Petri dishes out there, if you will, testing stuff and trying stuff and learning and growing together. And we have just a, a really amazing family that uh, if you're an active real estate investor, we'd love to talk to you to learn more. You can go to investorfuel.com and learn more. If you like what you see, you can book a call with us to see if you might be a fit and we go from there. So love to tell you more about it. Just go to investorfuel.com. See you on the next show. Are you an active real estate investor? If so, and you want to latch on to the power of surrounding yourself with over a hundred of the nation's leading real estate investors, all committed to building stronger businesses and living richer, fuller lives, you should jump on a call with us to learn more about Investor Fuel. Simply visit investorfuel.com to get started.